Now we take up the practice of specific principles because nothing greater can come into your experience than what you embody in your own consciousness. It is possible that you can receive healings through practitioners and teachers. In fact, many wonderful healings do take place. But please remember that in the long run, these are of minor importance because just to be relieved of some sickness today or tomorrow isn't too important if you have to look forward to another one next month or next year. The purpose of our mission is not merely to change your present state of ill health into good health. As a matter of fact, the healing of mind or body or purse is only one of the added things of a spiritual ministry. The spiritual ministry really consists of helping the seeker to find the kingdom of God. We are told right from the beginning to take no thought for what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal you shall be clothed, but to seek ye the kingdom of God, the realm of God, the consciousness of God, and then all of these things will be added. And so it is that your outer demonstration of life, your permanent outer demonstration of life, isn't going to be any greater than your attained inner consciousness of truth. It operates in this fashion. As you look around this room, you will soon perceive that there is neither good nor evil in this room. There really is neither good nor evil in this room. As a matter of fact, as you look out onto the street, uh, across the city, there is no good or evil in this city. Not a bit of it. As you go up in an airplane, and you can look out and see a hundred square miles around you, be assured there is no evil there and there is no good there. There is no evil and there is no good in this entire world. And it is for this reason that many people will come to Hawaii and say, Oh, how beautiful it is here. Oh, how wonderful it must be to live here. And then they're surprised later when they find that we have just as much sickness in Hawaii as you have in uh, Washington. We have just as many physical diseases, just as many mental diseases. We have just as much poverty there in proportion to population as you have here. There's nothing wonderful about Hawaii. Really, there isn't. And we, from out of the state, come up to beautiful parts of the Pacific Northwest. And we look and we say, oh, how beautiful this is. What magnificent scenery. What a beautiful sun. What beautiful mountains. What beautiful lakes. And then some of you who live here and you say, it isn't so wonderful. We have just as much sickness here, just as much sin, just as much poverty. And then you say, my heavens, then... Now, what's the difference in being one place and another place? And really, there isn't. But the sin and the disease and the death and the poverty is not in a place. It's in consciousness, in the consciousness of the individual. This place is heaven to many. Hawaii is heaven to many. But this place I know is hell to many, and so is Hawaii. There is no heaven in any place, and there is no hell in any place. We carry heaven and hell in our consciousness. 
We carry our sins and our diseases in our consciousness. We carry our wealth and our poverty in our consciousness. Many times I have said, you can take a man out of the ghetto, but you can't always take the ghetto out of a man. You can take a man out of poverty, but you can't always take poverty out of the man. We have had millionaires who have starved to death because they wouldn't buy themselves food. No, you see, the secret of life is bound up in the word consciousness. Emerson saw this when he said, What you are shrieks so loudly I cannot hear what you say. Certainly. We carry our good and our evil in our own consciousness and as long as we are living purely the human life, there's not much we can do about it. Many people have tried to give up drinking or tried to give up gambling or tried to give up their sins. Other people have tried to give up their lack and limitation. And they haven't succeeded. And they try and try and fail and fail because until a new note enters our consciousness, we remain very much what environment, influence, family brought us to. Each one of us in our humanhood carries a certain amount of prenatal influence from our ancestry. Each one of us carries with us a certain amount from the environment in which we grew up. Family environment, school environment, social environment. Each one of us carries around a certain amount of influence from our family's failures or our family's successes and a great deal of their diseases we carry with us. Not because we inherited them, but because we took them on through environmental influence. They had headaches and we get headaches, and they were subject to this and we are subject to that, and so forth. Humanly, we try our best to overcome our handicaps, and very often we fail. <clears throat> now it is a strange thing that very often when you speak to psychologists who have experience with prison workers, they'll say, well, these men couldn't help it. They were born in the ghetto and that was their surroundings and this is what you have to expect. They forget all of the great men who are occupying positions the highest in the world who were born in those same influences, in those same neighborhoods, and uh, didn't end up in prison. We have in New York City a great institution. It is called a club of the Grand Street Boys. They have their own beautiful building in the mid part of town. The membership consists of men who are prominent attorneys, doctors, dentists, judges, mayors, governors, bankers, brokers. They have all one thing in common. They were born and brought up in the Bowery and all went to the Grand Street School down in the Bowery and graduated from the Grand Street Grammar School in the Bowery. The most wicked, the poorest, the ugliest part of New York City. And here they are, a great big club of men, all of whom have become successful or prosperous or honored. And all born in the same neighborhood and went to the same school that lots of the boys in Sing Sing came from. So that there is something in a man that is greater than the environment into which he was born. 
there is something in men and women greater than their early influences. But it doesn't come to light in all. So that some do go on and become successful and others do remain victims of their environment, victims of their early influence. For us, <clears throat> there is a secret. A secret not known to them. Not even to many of those who became successful and prosperous. Even they often do not know what it is that is responsible for their being different. This secret that we have enables any one of us to rise higher than we are at this moment. Enables us to cancel out the penalties of our past sins or diseases or lacks or limitations. Something that enables us to teach our children how to overcome the negative influences or evil influences, enables them to overcome even lack of education, and that something is the Spirit of God in man. Now this is a universal thing. Every individual has it. It makes no difference whether they're Jew or Gentile or whether they're Occidental or Oriental, and it makes no difference whether they're saint or sinner. Everyone, everyone who has ever been born into this world has in them the Spirit of God. To bring it into functioning, into fruition, it becomes necessary to recognize it, to acknowledge it, and finally to make actual contact with it. Now it helps if someone on the spiritual path enters your life to recognize the Son of God in you, it helps you, or rather it helps your child or your grandchild, when in addition to seeing them as your child or grandchild, you also begin to ignore the outer appearance and look through and say, uh-oh, there's something greater than this about you. There is also this Spirit of God in you. But the great secret of life is when we ourselves come to the recognition of this and then go on to a further step until we actually make contact with it. Because the Spirit of God in man is a tangible something. There's no use trying to define it or analyze it. You can call it God if you like, <clears throat> which uh, the Buddhists wouldn't like at all because they do not acknowledge it as a God. You can term it the Christ if you like, but then that's apt to make you think it's something Christian. And it's neither Jewish nor Christian no Buddhist, no Vedantist. It's just the Spirit of God which existed before Abraham was, before there was a Hebrew race or an Oriental race or religion. The Spirit of God is an infinite something. Infinite in being, infinite in activity, infinite and eternal in its operation. But above all things, it is omnipresence, because it is always present where I am. It is always present where thou art. As a matter of fact, 
as long as you can say or think I, you are consciously in its presence. And if you're unconscious and can neither say nor think I, it is still there, only you are not consciously aware of it. As long as you can realize that I am, that I exist, you are realizing the Spirit of God in the midst of you. Because its name is I. That is the name of the Spirit of God, the presence of God. I. It defines itself as I am. Well, of course, if I am, it cannot be true that I am not. So as long as I can realize I am, I am living my eternal life. Because I am is not a person called Joel. I am is the life of me, which is also the life of you, since there is only one life. You may have roses growing in your gardens and rhododendrons and violets and pinks and whatnots, but you only have one life in your garden, regardless of the name you give to the flowers. And so it is you may have twelve children, but you only have one life even though you give each child a different name. Now, there is this spirit in man, this infinite presence which I am, the spirit of God in me. And the mere fact that I acknowledge this becomes the first great blessing in my experience because I know now that I'm not alone I know now that I'm not responsible for my life tonight or tomorrow or the day after and that actually there's nothing much I can do about it all I can do is go on being as I am but I have no control the control lies in that Spirit of God within me, which determines my life, determines the fact that I am on earth, determines my continuity on earth, determines when I shall become invisible to human sight and continue my work on another plane. There too, you see, material sense has tried to wreck this world by making everybody afraid of death or dreading it or wanting to put it off because the word death really means an end, oblivion, unconsciousness. But you see, there is no such thing as death. The life which God gave us is eternal and it can never die. And that is why, Paul said, neither what you call death nor life can separate me from the love of God. But there must inevitably come a time when we pass from visible sight. Otherwise, life could be a horribly monotonous thing. If you can just imagine going on for the next hundred years drawing Social Security and trying to live on it, you soon discover it can be a monotonous and dull thing. And for most people, especially in this age of income tax, it's virtually an impossibility to earn enough to retire on. So the most that 80% of this world has to look forward to is living on Social Security. And if you think there's going to be any pleasure in uh, looking forward to that for any great length of time, you're mistaken. Inevitably, there comes a time when we will have had our fun as children. We will have had the experience of the years of education. We will have had the joys of marriage and parenthood. And whatever may be left as pleasures of grandparenthood. But then what? Just continuing on that same old route? Oh no. 
Now we are being prepared for something better than that. We had to outgrow childhood, no matter how wonderful it was. And no matter how wonderful it is to look back on now, for those of you who have something good to look back on, you had to outgrow it and leave it. And you discovered that your years of school, of high school, or maybe college, were far better than your childhood. But as nice as they were, they had to be outgrown, they had to be left behind, responsibilities had to be assumed. And then, of course, when you think of your marriage and your young children, you say, ah, oh, those were the glorious years. But as glorious as they were, they had to be outlived, outgrown. And so you're going to find that eventually this that we call the human experience must be outgrown. This human body must be, or our concept of it, must be put off because we are being prepared here for further experiences. And each one of us must assume the responsibilities. Whatever education or lack of it that you've had, whatever experience you've had on earth, is your preparation for your next experience. Now, <clears throat> while we are here, we want the best and the finest because we're entitled to it. Remember that we're children of God, we're heirs of God, joint heirs to all the heavenly riches. And in our human experience, nobody is having all of that joy and wonder. Therefore, the secret lies in this. First, the recognition that there is a Spirit of God in me, governing me, maintaining me, sustaining me, going before me to make the crooked places straight, to prepare mansions for me, to prosper me, to make my work more successful, more abundant, to make my marriage happier to make my family life more joyous. There is that within me doing it. I am come, the Master says, that ye might have life and that ye might have life more abundantly. There is that in me. And so my great good fortune comes, first of all, when I recognize that. My second great fortune comes when I realize that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, so that instead of trying to enjoy you or your companionship as males or females or friends, I commence to enjoy looking into the Spirit of God in you and beholding it in you and realizing it in you. because. The first thing you know, I begin to get acquainted with it. And the God of me begins to know the God of you. The Spirit of God in me begins to tabernacle with the Spirit of God in you. And we discover that we really have a bond, a great bond between us. And those of our students who have traveled with us in many parts of the world have seen that regardless of what part of the world we're in, we have this wonderful communion, this wonderful fellowship, this wonderful joy in being together. And it's for this reason that so many of our students are traveling with us from city to city, not only in the United States, but about 30 of them are going to London this trip with us. And a lot of those will be with us on the continent. Why? We have discovered the Son of God in each other. And we love our companionship. We enjoy our being together. We find something greater than human friendship or human relationship. I mean human family relationship. So it is that I have discovered in my travels in the world when I was single a great joy. I've traveled so many years, 55 I guess or more, that uh, I, I'm not as interested in scenery as I once was, but in people. And I'm finding, in the, and I found in the people that I met here, there, and everywhere in the world, some kind of a joyous relationship. Now as my wife and I travel, we find it 
wherever we are, not only in each other, but in those we meet. And so it is that the second great joy comes when I realize that the same Spirit of God that is in me is in every individual. And so, as I meet the people in hotels or in the airplanes or patients or students, I'm always on the lookout for that Spirit of God in them to come popping out, and sooner or later it does. They hide it for a while, not intentionally, it's because they don't even know they have it. But sooner or later, my recognition of it begins to bring it springing forth, and then we find that we have a communion. Now, a third miracle takes place when, through my meditations, I come into an actual experience with that Spirit of God. Not merely knowing that it's there, but now actually experiencing it and very often hearing it speak. It has many ways of speaking. Sometimes, sometimes I actually hear it as a voice, an audible voice. Mostly, I don't hear it as an audible voice, but I get it as an impression. <clears throat> when I was carrying this message in the United States and had never thought of Europe, one day sitting at my desk, the voice in a definite voice said, go to New York, give a class, and then to London, England. Why London, England? I don't know, but I had to go there to find out. So it was when I had an invitation to come to South Africa. And I thought, how foolish can it be that we have about 30 students in South Africa and I should go 15,000 miles to reach 15 students? Yes, go to South Africa. And I went there and found 800 students. Only knew about 30, but found 800 waiting. So it is that the voice, whether it speaks audibly or whether it merely speaks as an impression, it does let us know that it's there. It does assure us, I will never leave thee nor forsake me. I will be with thee unto the end of the world. It does assure us, it speaks in the language that the Master used. I am the bread, the meat, the wine, and the water. It isn't Jesus who voiced that. It was the Spirit of God in Jesus that spoke through him and said to the Hebrew people, I am not merely Jesus' bread, wine, and water. I am your bread, wine, and water. And even if Jesus isn't around, I will still be your bread, meat, wine, and water. I the Spirit of God in you is your bread, meat, wine, and water. It is your Savior. It is your mediator between the Son of God and the Father. It is the healer, the redeemer, the reformer, the supplier, the multiplier of loaves and fishes. I, I can give you water, and if you drink it, you will never thirst again. I can give you bread and meat, that if you eat it, you will never hunger again. And you say, what does it mean? Well, it just means this, that if you are satisfied to be fed by the I within you, that in due course, the money will be there to buy the actual food, or it will be brought to your doorstep as it was to Elijah shared by a poor widow or found on the stones in front of him, it makes no difference. In one way or another, if you accept I in the midst of you as the Son of God, you will be fed, clothed, housed abundantly unto the end of your days. 
I, the Spirit of God in you, am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And if you will take your gaze from out here, from your husband or your parent or your investments, I don't mean throw them away or refuse them, but I mean forget for a moment and realize Yes, you may be the channels through which this is reaching me, but since there is this I in the midst of me, even if I didn't have these channels, new ones would appear. Because it is I, the Spirit of God in you, that raised up the husband or the parent or the investment that is now the channel of your supply or the employment. In other words, it makes you appreciative of the channels through which your present happiness or supply is coming, but no longer dependent upon them. Because I, in the midst of you, can give you water and such a supply of it that it will never run dry. I, in the midst of you, gives you such an abundance of food and clothing and housing, it will never, never run out. You will learn why the Hebrews had to learn not to pick manna for tomorrow. It only meant do not take concern for tomorrow's food. Don't worry about it and don't worry about storing it up where moth and rust can corrupt because I in the midst of you that gave it to you today am still functioning tomorrow and tomorrow's tomorrow. You remember some of you, at least, in the early Depression years, how many people jumped out of windows when they lost their fortune? Well, you would have imagined that God's fortunes came to an end. And they only stopped to realize that the same intelligence that gave them that fortune could give them ten more fortunes. They could win and lose fortune after fortune after fortune. It would make no difference to God. God's supply never lessens, whether it's a depression year or a boom year. It doesn't decrease or increase. There's always enough grass to cover the ground, always enough <coughs> fish in the sea and birds in the air and cattle on a thousand hills, just as much vegetables in the ground, always just as much diamonds, just as much pearls, rubies, whatnot. God's supply never lessens. Therefore, whatever happens to it out here, be not concerned as long as you have contact with I within you. I within you. The presence of God am come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundant. Therefore, look unto me. Look unto me. Look unto the Spirit of God that is within you. Ah, yes, but don't forget this. Never look upon me as a man. Never look upon your neighbor or relative as a man or woman. Oh no. No. Never forget that in all your relationships you must look unto the Son of God in them. Then you will have the outer relationship that is normal and harmonious and joyous. But if you are looking to a man or woman to be good, you can well be fooled before you get through with this life. If you are looking to some man or woman to be honest with you, you can well be fooled before you get through. But if in all of your human relationships you insist on looking through to the Spirit of God in them, you will have your protection. You'll be protected from the evil ones of this world, and none of the weapons that are formed against you will prosper if you are looking unto me. If you are looking unto the Spirit of God in man to tabernacle with. So, all right, after you've looked and found the Spirit within me, then if you want to sit down and have a meal or talk as a friend or ride in the automobile, that's fine. But be sure, first of all, you have made contact with the Spirit of God in me, otherwise I'll like it mean later. Or decide I like your jewels. Be sure.
sure as you deal with your banker and your broker and your lawyer and your doctor and your department store clerk, be sure that you're not thinking of them as honest men or women but that you're looking right through and beholding the Son of God in them, then your relationship with them will be harmonious and joyous and right. And if by chance they do have evil intent, they'll be removed from your influence, because no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper as long as you are beholding Christ incarnate in me, in man. No weapon that is formed against thee can prosper. But don't think for a minute that as long as you are looking out on honest men and women, don't think for a minute that here and there one of them isn't going to trip you up. Because it's happened to about everybody that's ever lived long enough. See through the appearance and see me as I am. You have to begin with your own families because that's where it's most difficult. You are so accustomed to loving your children in a purely human way that when you sit down and try to ignore their humanhood and behold the Spirit of God in them, you're going to find it difficult. It's almost as if uh, someone were asking you to stop loving the child. Because you are called upon, for the time being, to ignore the child as a child and as your child or your grandchild, and be sure that you can look right through and say, I know in the midst of you there is the child of God, the Spirit of God indwells you. And, and you keep it up day after day for five minutes until sooner or later you make contact with the Spirit of God in your own child. And you have to do it with your husband and your wife. There is very, very little happiness on earth between men and women if they only are honest enough to admit it. There's something about the human experience that, that just doesn't permit too much permanent happiness on that level. And there are too many things upon which we can disagree. But if you ever make contact with the Spirit of God in your husband or wife, you'll enter a whole new relationship. You'll find that a whole new dimension of life has been opened to you. It's no longer purely human. It doesn't mean that you won't have your disagreements, because as individuals, each one of us is entitled to an individual outlook on life. We have no right to be dominated by what our husband or wife thinks or believes on many different things. Those disagreements may continue forever and should, because we should each be an individual. But that has no right to cause unhappiness, just because each one of us wants to feel politically the way we do, or financially, or some other way. The real accord that there is in marriage is when we once find the spiritual center of our mate, when we have once discovered the Son of God, the child of God, the presence of God in them. Then in addition to a beautiful human experience, we have a very sacred spiritual relationship. Then, then you can begin to understand what is meant in the marriage ceremony about what God hath joined together. Because I am sure that every married couple must sooner or later have the feeling that God didn't join us together. If he did, he, he, he would had his eyes uh, tied up. Because in our humanhood, uh, it just isn't. But you will discover that there is a relationship between us that God did establish. And that relationship can never be broken once we've discovered it. There is no power in heaven or on earth 
that can break the relationship between two people who have discovered the Spirit of God in each other. Whether it's on the marital level, whether it's on the parent and child level, whether it's on the patient and practitioner level, or the student and teacher level, or the friend level, or partner and business level, the moment that you discover the Son of God in each other, you have a relationship that is eternal. It doesn't mean that your banker will always be your banker, or your broker will always be your broker, or your lawyer will always... It doesn't mean that. It means that the relationship, the spiritual relationship, will be intact. You'll find that when you have discovered the Son of God in your child, that it will not matter so much to you when your child marries and goes away, or if they decide to live on the other side of the ocean. Because that spiritual bond will have come forth into manifestation so that you'll say, well, I certainly don't miss your body. I have you. I have you. You are with me wherever I am. And so it is that as our time comes to uh, separate into the invisible, that we will leave no grief behind us no grief whatsoever. There will be a Godspeed to those who depart. And instead of tears, there will just be bon voyage or aloha. Take it with you. And that, that is as it should be. There should be no grief. Why should there be grief as each one of us goes, oh, there'll always be missing that human companionship. That's the normal natural thing. But grief? No, there should be Godspeed. Godspeed on your way. You're going into the invisible. You're going into your destiny. And may the grace of God and the peace of God always be with you. Not should I in my selfishness want you back here where you no longer fit. You see... There is a Spirit of God in me, and sooner or later I discover it, come in contact with it, and it becomes the reality of me. I look unto it for my guidance, for my safety, for my security, for my abundance, for my joy, and then I take whatever I find out here in the human picture as the added thing. But I have learned <clears throat> that this is only one part of the picture. Until I have discovered the Son of God in you, we have no relationship. We're just two physical bodies out here that have no interest in each other. But it all changes in that moment when I realize divine sonship in you, and then sooner or later it bubbles out. And I see it, and I feel it, and I tabernacle with it, and I have a joy in it. <clears throat> no, in this long life of travel I have seen that the human existence has very little of joy in it, very little of any permanent pleasure even in the companionships, until we have discovered something beneath the surface in each other. Then when we've discovered something beneath the surface, we really have a joyous life to which to look forward. Now, <clears throat> this that we have called the Son of God in us, or Presence of God in us, is something inseparable and indivisible from me, because I and the Father are one. And it is wisdom to remember that it is because of this oneness with this invisible that I am one with all my good in the visible. In other words, because I am consciously one with the invisible, this conscious oneness 
brings to me all the good that's in you or through you. It brings to me my good from every part of the globe. It comes from the uttermost parts of the earth and in whatever form is necessary to my immediate experience. Therefore, in one of our writings we have the theme, my conscious oneness with God constitutes my oneness with all spiritual being and idea. And that is this I. This I is come that I might have life and that I might have it more abundantly and it goes before me and draws you to me and draws out of you the best of human relationships to me, draws out of me the best of human relationships to you. This invisible presence goes out and draws to me everything needful for my activity, whatever form that may be. Now you must remember this. <clears throat> Since God is infinite, God is infinite in expression, and therefore we are not all meant to be spiritual teachers or spiritual practitioners. We're not all meant to be lawyers or doctors or architects. Each one of us has a destiny. Each one of us has an individual destiny, and that destiny is entrusted to the Son of God in us. That Son of God in us contains our abilities, our capacities, our strength, the length of our days. The length of our days is not determined by marks on the palms of the hand, but maybe the marks on the palm of our hands may show forth what our destiny inside is. That may be. Our destiny is not determined by stars, but stars may be an outer indication of what our inner destiny is. Our destiny is locked up within ourselves in the spiritual Son of God in us. And as long as I am consciously aware of this presence within me and within you, I am consciously one with all of the God everywhere, all of the good everywhere. It boils itself down to the fact that as human beings, we are a branch of a tree that is cut off and withers and dies. But that the moment we come into the realization and demonstration of our w spiritual oneness with our source, from that moment we are the branch that is now one with the tree. And therefore we're no longer a branch, we're a tree. We never look at a tree and say, oh, you are the trunk and you are the branches and you are the roots. We just look at it and say, you are the tree. And so it is, once we are consciously one with God, we are the Christ. We are the Christ. We have attained our Christhood. Not by virtue of myself. My Christhood is by virtue of my oneness with the Father. I the Father and I the Son. And in that oneness I have attained Christhood. The Orientals have the same teaching, only they call it Buddhahood. But Christhood and Buddhahood mean the same thing. And in Christianity we call it having that mind that was in Christ Jesus, and in Buddhism they call it having the Buddha mind. All religions are alike, all basic religions in that that they acknowledge divine sonship. But they acknowledge it as something to be attained. You're not born into it. You're not born into it. You are born as a mortal. You are born as a human. You are born as a branch that is cut off. That will not always be. Ah, no. When our young students now, our young girls and boys, marry, and realize that they are not going to be the parents of their children. That their children have a higher destiny than being born 
of marriage or being born of the flesh. When our youngsters taught in this spiritual truth realize that God is to appear on earth in another form, that another son of God is to come into expression, not your child or mine, not somebody that looks like you or looks like me, but somebody that looks like God and acts like God. When they are united in marriage, in that realization, their children will be born into their Christhood. They will not have to come through a truth teaching. They will be born into their Christhood because before conception their parents will know that our coming together is just a part of the destiny of this child to give it visible expression. But God is its father. No man on earth is its father, and no woman on earth is its mother. God is its father and its mother, its creative principle. And all that God is, it will show forth. And that will change the nature of the child from the father who says, oh, it's going to be like me, and the mother who's hoping it's going to be like her, and the grandmother who's looking for signs that it looks like her. No. No, no, we are going to acknowledge that there is but one Father, God. And God is the creator of all, the maintainer of all, and the sustainer of all. And we are just the instruments through which God's grace comes to earth. And then God's grace will come forth as our children. And our children will be showing forth not the glory of their human parentage or their bloodline, they will be showing forth their divine parentage and the grace and the capacities of their divine parent. This will all be left for our young girls and boys of today to demonstrate, to prove. And I do believe that in our work we have a most wonderful group of youngsters in all parts, wherever our work is, and I'm sure that we're going to see a beautiful relationship. One of these children, born under the grace of God, for the first six years of his life, I think, determined he was going to be a fireman. But one day he said to his mother, you know, mother, I'm not going to be a fireman. I'm going to work for Jesus and heal the sick. He hadn't been told anything about that. And do you know what's happened to him since? All of the children in the neighborhood come to him to pray for them. And he does. Oh, yes, we're going to have a different breed of children once we know the source once we know the divine heritage, once we know that there is a Spirit of God in every one of us, and instead of letting it lie dormant, we're going to recognize it, acknowledge it, acknowledge Him in all thy ways. Acquaint now thyself with the God in your child, in your husband, in your wife, in your neighbor, in your enemy. Because eventually, we must obey the Master and pray for our enemies, which means acknowledging the Christ in them. For they have it. Don't ever think they haven't. They have it. It is in each and every individual. No one has ever been sent forth without it. It has been our joy to witness the healing of children born with incurable diseases, proving that God never made a child with an incurable disease. God never sent anyone into this earth without his own son in the midst of them. And all it took was the recognition of that divine sonship to overcome these prenatal incurable conditions. So, you see, I started off by saying, now we come to the practice of these principles. Do you see now why I repeat so often in the books, don't look to these books for any miracles, there are no miracles in these books. The miracle is in your consciousness, in what you do 
with the truth in these books. There's no miracle in this class. The miracle is whether or not you are willing to go home and set aside every day a period of five or ten minutes to take some member of the family and tabernacle with the Son of God in them until the day comes when it actually pops out. And you say, aha, I have made contact with it. And then another member, and then another, and then the neighbors, and so forth. Until it just becomes normal and natural with anyone and everyone you meet to recognize it. At first, it's hard work before you really make conscious contact with the Son of God. But after a while, it's just as simple as uh, rubbing your fingers together. You just look up, and there it is. Thank you for this great privilege. Thank you. Thank you.